Let's talk waterfowl. I've duck hunted before, but most of my wing shooting experience has been with doves. After a trip to Michigan recently for my first goose hunt, shout out to Mike, I have been really interested in learning more about waterfowl. Enter Matt Bratton. Matt's been waterfowl hunting for about 14 years, and he's now a guide for waterfowl in Central Virginia. This guy's incredibly knowledgeable, and in addition to being a great bird hunter himself, he has worked with a great call manufacturer for about the last decade, so the guy knows calling in and out. Matt is going to give us a really good look at the gear it takes to get into waterfowl hunting. It's going to help you shop for calls online a little better. We'll talk through all these calls for geese and ducks, and Matt's even going to dust off a call or two to show us how these things work. It is a great show. Now, before I go on, please do subscribe here on YouTube or wherever you're listening to this show. And if you're on YouTube or if you're on Go Wild, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Give us a, the, the fire emoji there on Go Wild and comment and let us know what you'd like to see in future shows. We love that. Now, I also have to mention, if you have not taken the time to join Go Wild, that time is right now because you can get $10 for just downloading the app and creating an account. If you're already Remember, you know you can unlock some crazy rewards on Go Wild. We're talking steep discounts on optics, free swag, all kinds of cool stuff, including you could apply those discounts to some of the calls on this very show. Visit DownloadGoWild.com and join today. All right, enough promotion. Let's talk about hunting some birds. This is Gearbox Talk with Matt Bratton. Brad, and welcome to Gearbox Talk. How's it going, man? Hey, Brad. Thanks for having me. Good. How are you? Good, man. I'm doing well. And I got to say, you got the most authentic hunting setup one could ask for to talk waterfowl. You've even got your dog sitting next to you. Yep. Yep. He's uh, he, he's ready to go, man. Yeah, dude, he is ready to go. I feel like he's just waiting on you to pull and take a bird down. and He's going to spring out of there. Yeah, when I start blowing the duck call, you'll see what happens. He starts looking around. <laughs> I right, look forward to that. You got to wait to the end. We're going to save that to the end of the show. That's all right. right. So Matt is joining us today. We're going to do a little entry level into waterfowl. So before we dive into call specifically, he's going to give us some tips on calling here in a second. We're going to talk through just really some of the gear you need to get into waterfowl hunting in general. We'll talk a little bit about duck and goose specifically. But Matt, can you walk us through some of the, the things that you're going to need if you're getting into waterfowl hunting for the first time, because not a lot of this gear is specific, specifically to waterfowl hunting. It's not like just, I have a shotgun. There's more than that. Uh, walk us through some of these things you're going to need to think through on purchasing. So one of the, the first things I'd say is go out and get you a six pack of mallard decoys. They are the most popular duck in the United States. It's, it, there's a bunch of different brands out there you can find. I mean, I, I personally like to run everything on a Texas rig. Um, which is a lot easier to pack in and stuff like that. So it's got a little hook right there and your weights down here. Um, another thing I would say, I mean, if you're, if you're new into it, is a, is a jerk string. So uh, you can find a bunch of different types of them, but uh, they're, they're really good for creating realistic motion. Um, I, I think that's probably one of my number one tools when duck hunting, especially late season when ducks get pressured is, is, is putting the mojos away or the spinning wing decoys and, and just going, I just call it old school jerk string and three or four decoys and you're good. Um, one thing that your landowners will appreciate, pick you up a mojo pick stick. You can put it anywhere. They make them collapse. It's got a magnetic end to pick up all your holes. And uh, landowners really appreciate when you pick up your trash. So yeah, pick that's up a trash. good one to make sure you get invited back. Yeah, yeah, I'm very big on that. Um, uh, as far as anything else, I mean, a good pair of head trimmers. Um, you could go with old fashioned loppers, you know, for cutting brush. I personally bought a uh, electric one from Harbor Freight with a rechargeable battery. Works great for cutting new brush. Um, it really saves your back. It cuts your blind brush in time or whatever. And I'd say in half at least. Yeah. And we, we ran into a situation uh, up in Michigan where you kind of had to pivot and all of a sudden we're cutting down corn and we had the electric and it was so nice because it's zip right through and then you can get to work instead of sitting there trying to saw through uh, with, with a, you know, a handsaw or something. Yep. Right there, man. That's the way to go. There it is. This thing right here is a lifesaver. I mean, yep. it, it, it'll last yep. about four or five hours. So anyways, yeah, that's a good tool. Um, 
I don't think you need to get crazy on a pair of waders. I think if you're just starting out, I'd, I'd you know, find you a decent pair of neoprene waders that uh, are comfortable and uh, go with it. Yep. What else? Anything else in the beginner list that we need to think through? What about for the dog? Um, yeah, well, the dog for me personally is something I would not do entry level because, you know, if it, it's a lot of an investment, honestly, time and money wise and a dog. And, and what if you go a couple times, you know, and it's not really your fit because your area just isn't the best for public options or, you know, a lot of different factors. But um, a dog is always a great tool. Um, yeah. I would say invite a buddy that has a dog. There we go. Um, that's I usually get invited back because I have the dog <laughs> and he makes our life easier. Uh, they yeah. don't like me; they just like him. But yeah. um, I would say, as far as shotgun shells go, um, lead's illegal. Don't shoot lead. Um, steel shot. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of different brands out there. I mean, Kent, Federal, Winchester, all that. I personally shoot Boss shot shells. It's a copper plated bismuth. And it, it's the closest thing you could ever get to lead, in my opinion. Um, and it's a uh, really good American-made company. So I, I like to support them. Awesome. And we're going to put links to everything that we're talking through here. So if, you, if you're you know already curious about how we're to find some of this stuff, don't worry. We did all that work for you. We've got all that in the show notes. As Matt talks about it, our team will oh, oh, uh, curate that list for us. All right. I want to talk through calls. So um, something, something my team and I were talking about recently is, you know, it's one thing, and, and you and I even mentioned this before the show, getting into waterfowl hunting is one of those things where it's really nice to have somebody that, that can help you along. But if you're, if you're just coming into this, like a lot of millennials are getting into hunting, you know, uh, there's a food aspect here. And I think that's drawn in a lot of attention. If you're Googling your way through this, finding the right call can be tough because a lot of call manufacturer companies are, they, they, they're made for people that know what they're looking for. But if you don't, and you're Googling online, you may not know exactly what tonality you need in, in, a, in a call or what it means to uh, have this size call versus another size or, or you know, which, which can affect how easy it is uh, to use. So uh, can you talk through a little bit of how you select the right call at that beginner level for, for both? Let's talk, do it for duck and goose. What are the things that you need to consider as a beginner? So essentially for me, it's got to be air control. Um, both duck and goose you want a call that's easy easy to blow as a beginner, right? I mean, you don't want to pick something that takes too much air. Well, you can't quite figure out how to quack on it because it's taking you too much air and it's just not sounding right. So that's one of the biggest things I have seen over the years is that people would pick a call, their first one, they go for the most expensive one, which the most expensive one in theory, what you're getting versus the more cost-effective ones is going to be the materials, right? So your more expensive calls are going to be acrylic. Um, your less expensive ones are going to be a combination of acrylic and poly or just a straight poly duck or goose call. I, I saw it too uh, recently. And again, I'm not a waterfowl hunter. I, it's actually something I was just telling you, I really want to get into it. But I was, I was also learning that you can buy a call that the reeds are already broken in, I think. Can you talk through a little bit of that in case somebody that's researching is kind of wondering what that's about? So that is going to be um, on the goose end. So like the goose call I personally run has broken guts in it. That's a more advanced gut base and tone board. Um, there, a lot of times you'll hear people say shave in the reed, right? So for in layman's terms, for a general person that's just starting out, that really does not matter. Um, that's more so for your more advanced callers that want to get a little bit more out of the call. And uh, it's basically like, you know, customizing your car. It's the best way I can put it. Um, on the duck end, I mean, they're all going to show up. The reeds are going to be cut. They're going to be tuned, right? So, I mean, on a duck end, you might have to tune it a little bit. As for, When I say tune it, as in cutting the reeds a little bit here and there, maybe shorter on the, basically on the bottom of the reed to, to adjust it more for you. But uh, I will say in general, manufacturers do a great job at, you know, setting you up with what you need. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so really though, for a beginner, maybe stay, you don't need the the broken guts. It's going to, you're just really trying to find something that's going to be at a price point that's comfortable with you. You're not getting too committed. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Um, let's talk about some of your favorite calls, man. What are you working with? I know you, I know you like the Hayes calls brands. Uh, maybe we can start with that or whatever, you, whatever you want to talk through. I'm just kind of curious what you're running. 
so oh another thing to have is have something nice to put your put your uh duck calls in that way they don't get dirty because there's nothing worse than going to blow in a duck call and there's a thorn sitting in there just that's what you happened it's yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna pick on my buddy mike uh i just we were up in michigan and and he had a big chunk of something stuck in his goose call and it was rendered useless the entire time right so i've got here the most i'll tell you for a beginner a whistle you can do anything from a, a mallard a wood duck a widgeon a pintail a teal all on this one whistle so that's a very important tool i feel like for somebody because this is also very easy to learn how to use okay um and it's it, it's something honestly that people don't spend a lot of time focusing on um you know most people think okay i'm gonna go duck hunting i'm gonna buy a double reed mallard call and i'm gonna quack like a hen well there's so much more you can get out of other species on this yeah you're kind of doubling down what are the um i'm, I'm kind of jumping around here now but i'm curious like uh, i'm thinking through like turkey calling or my white tail calling um what are the scenarios when a duck whistles versus you know your tip, typical quack like what is the the sound like what are they saying differently when they're whistling so a mallard drake is going to sound like this <laughs> right and you, when you think of a mallard hen that's what you think of right mm -hmm. well then you have a wood duck or you get into a widgeon <laughs> and then you can do the teal and stuff like that so you're basically hitting your different species you're targeting yeah, so you've got a variation uh, between your calls, and then some of them, like the mallard, you're, that's uh, multi-call. You're going to have multiple calls that can do that bird. But a lot of your smaller ducks, it seems, sounds like, are are the that's where the whistle comes into play, right? Right. Okay. Right. Yep. That's going to be exactly right. And what were those first two calls you used there? What, what you you, uh, you went so to two right is, away? That is a uh, that's the haze, haze right? all in one whistle. Yep, yep. all in one whistle. Um, very cost effective. 39 bucks i think and they come with a lanyard drop that's awesome um this is the most popular haze has ever made it's called the whiskey bob wire it's uh acrylic barrel and a poly insert and easy to blow yep okay what else do you got there yeah do, do you have a couple other ones so this is what i run this is a uh it's a cut down style call so there's you know rnt makes some haze makes some a lot of different manufacturers make them um, this is something that takes, in my opinion, a long time to figure out. Um, but the, you listen to the quack on this, <laughs> hear that rasp that that has. Yeah. Or you talk about a feed chuckle. <laughs> it just, it's a different variation of tone that, you know, sometimes ducks love it. Sometimes they don't. Yeah, so it's it's like turkeys. You just got to find that. You know, sometimes the raspy. It's like hand. having a different cut, different cut of mouth call or a glass versus a slate. It, it's yeah. it's all about what fits you and what the situation is. Yeah. No, I'm curious. Um, again, I'm I'm still learning all this stuff too. So forgive my beginner qu questions here, but I feel like that's kind of who's listening. Um, you know, with with turkeys. Um, weather can also you know you might use a slate when it's a little harder to hear to cut through wind or rain or something do you find that with the waterfowl calls too are there certain times when it's uh you know a certain style call can cut louder is there is there one you kind yep. of favor in those situations yeah absolutely so um a double reed is not going to be as loud as a single reed duck call right single reeds can different variations and forms fyi for everybody listening a double reed is easier to blow that is that is what i recommend starting with single reed takes a little bit more air control see i'm going back to air right so a single reed is going to be louder and you're going to be able to get in my opinion more out of it a double reed is just you know that's tried and true that's just every day this will work. If it's really windy, you want to be able to be louder. If it's not windy, I'm, in my luck and experience, every time I go duck hunting, there's no wind. <laughs> um, it you got to be quiet because when they get within a hundred yards, a lot of times guys will do what I call they blow them out of the hole. 
they'll sit there and hail call it a duck when it's a hundred yards away. And the duck's sitting there thinking, why is that duck so loud? I'm yeah. looking at it. You know what I mean? But it, right. So it's kind of like turkey hunt, right? So you're not going to, you're not going to yelp as loud as you can at a turkey that's coming in a hundred, 120 yards, right? You're going to maybe putt or cluck or do some stuff like that. Yeah. Right. Right. So you got variations, uh, just like with all things, um, any of the other right. haze calls you want to show off? I know they got the little, little badass is the one that I've seen, uh, a lot from them. Uh, tell me about that call. So that is, uh, Benny Marnie's favorite duck call ever. He is, <laughs> he has done so well with that duck call over the years, but, uh, we're trying to turn a new leaf and, uh, you know, ch change things up a little so bit. So that one's um, that, that's nothing so wrong with it. Going a different yeah, direction. So we're just, yeah. So we have the, uh, to replace that now, we have the backwoods. It's okay. going to be a Delrin barrel with a poly insert for 40 bucks. Okay. Um, that's our, that's our new, uh, we recommend this, you know, or the whiskey, right? So that one's yeah. whiskey's like 70, 70 bucks, whatever. Like those are the two that we're pushing now for people. Uh, quite honestly entry level okay um because they're extremely easy to blow and look i'm not trying to sit here and have a you know a haze calls party or anything but i will tell you one thing out of all the duck calls i've blown in my life they are the easiest to blow yeah well i mean they've so uh, i can't remember uh uh i was i was reading about them because we just started working with them which is how you and i got introduced and uh they got like 70 years of experience uh is it benny i can't remember which one of there's two two uh the yeah. founder and the co-owner uh so i mean it makes yeah. sense you're getting a lot of experience into the the making of this call when you got 70 years of waterfowl hunting behind it right that's exactly right and a lot of that goes to benny is you know he's he's a good duck caller like i am but we're not great right so i mean we want to make stuff that's just super easy for user friendly like that's the objective of every product they make right. and there's a lot of other companies that do the same right so it's not the haze is the only one but that's just what my personal preference is yeah no i get it man um and you know at the end of the day you got to pick something to take out in the woods so if you, you know uh it's not to say that there's not other brands that either one of us would like or, or anything uh just we're just happening to be talking about haze today um i do want to uh get a chance to hear a few calls so you know um i mentioned i haven't haven't done much waterfowl uh, i've done a duck hunt and a goose hunt and i really like both so uh, this will be a little bit of a teach brad and the audience here so um it was super fun for me when I got to go up to Michigan and watch these guys work the calls, work the birds, watch the birds, see how they're adjusting. I want to talk through goose a little bit first. Uh, do you got goose hall, calls on hand? Okay. I want to talk through this. Um, so it, as I'm watching and, and the birds are circling, to me, a novice, it looks like there's a lot of honking, but I, in doing some research to it, I know there's a lot, there's some nuance to these calls. So walk me through, you know, sp specifically for the Canada goose here, walk me through some of the scenarios and some of the calls you might do when you're goose hunting. So let's say I'm sitting in a cornfield and I see a group approaching at 200 yards, right? I want to get their attention. <laughs> <laughs> So that's initial like, hey, I'm over here honk, right? And as they get closer, you know, you can you can start to mix in honks and clucks, right? A lot of times you'll hear geese sitting on the ground. Another tip is when you go and scout for birds, duck or geese, is pay attention to what noises they're making. So a lot of times you'll hear them sitting on the ground going. <laughs> when another group is approaching, right? So you want to essentially just mimic what they're doing. And if now let's say that uh, two geese came in the decoys and my buddies missed them and I missed them too. Um, and I want to get their attention again. I might get really, really excited with them or say they're getting ready to leave. Maybe they came in, you know, and didn't like something, right? <laughs> That's just getting their attention, right? Saying, hey, look, we're still over here. And uh, I think the biggest, and I, I had to learn all this as, as, as the years went on for me, is knowing a lot of times, honestly, when to stop calling and shut up. Yeah. So the rule I like to go through is if the birds are looking at me and they're close, say within 100 yards, most of the time, I'm not going to say a word. 
I'm going to wait until they get off the corner, you know, you know what I mean? Like right off your corner of your blind or whatever, and maybe they're circling and then hit them again and let them come work. You know what I mean? You don't want to, you don't want to constantly just blow a call. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, that's like, that's really like the, the same thing with anything, right? You know, you can overcall right. deer, you can overcall your turkeys. Um, and I think the, one of the, probably the best things for anybody that's not been hunting a lot and decided they want to start with waterfowl is, is uh, mimicking what the actual birds are doing and also knowing when to shut up. Cause I, I mean, I, yeah. dude, I, I bring this guy up all the time. I'm telling people about turkey hunting and, and how to get in calling. And I, there's a guy that hunts a property next to what I hunt and every year. He gets out and every five minutes, it's the same Yelp pattern over and over and over. And I'm like, man, I haven't heard a bird all day, but you're out here talking your head off. And it's like what you said about, uh, you know, when, when you hear a duck, that's too loud. It's like, if no, none of the other turkeys are talking and and this one won't shut up, something's off. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Generally. So, I mean, (laughs) to circle back on a goose in, if there was two things that you could figure out to go goose hunting, it'd be a honk, (laughs) just simple honk. And then a clock. <laughs> if you can figure those two things out, you can kill geese. Okay. So that, it's that. That's awesome. Um, and I want to make sure we do a little bit of duck uh, advice too here. So same kind of thing. Tell me, give me a few quick rundowns on, on some of your beginner calls. You really need to hit home on waterfowl or, or on your duck hunts. So, I mean, it, it's got to be a quack. <laughs> And then you can mix in a little bit of a comeback caller. And then a feed chuckle, I would say, yeah, it's important. But one thing I've noticed over the years is a lot of times ducks are doing that when they're in the air, right? I mean, for me, when I go and scout a a hypothetical place and I hear ducks in the water, most of the time when I hear a mallard hen sitting there, that's what you hear. Okay. All right, man. Um, what have I not asked you about? You know, you're, you're, you're a guide. You, uh, you, you've you done, you know, almost 15 years of waterfowl hunting. Is there anything that's kind of mission critical to know for waterfowl hunting that we didn't at least touch on and point somebody down the right direction here today? I would, th- I, I'll honestly, like, I'm not joking, safety. Um, I have seen some crazy things happen in a duck blind or a goose field. Um, I know quite a few people that have almost drowned because they don't wear a life jacket in the boat. I mean, you got to think like it's three 30 in the morning. You're in a neoprene onesie essentially, right? Yeah. You're not supposed to be able to walk through water like that. Right. All right. And you're in a boat and it's to what? 20, 25 degrees. You're running off spotlights and all this. You hit a stump. Well, <laughs> you're in waders. The first thing you're going to do is start sinking. Wear yeah. a life jacket. Right. Second thing is, is uh, make sure that whenever your gun is not in your hand, that it is pointing in a safe direction, yeah. not at a dog. You know, for example, if you go hunt with, you get invited to go hunt with a buddy and he's got a dog, don't shoot over top of his dog. The way we say it is guide always shoots cripples, right? So my clients, I always tell them, I shoot cripples. You shoot when I tell you to shoot, you stop, right? I've, I've seen some some crazy things happen. So I, I know it sounds cliche, but my biggest one is safety because I've seen a lot of situations that could have been bad. Yep, and I'll throw it out too because I, have, I haven't hunted with dogs uh, a ton. Um, I've, I've photographed some, some quail hunts and whatnot, some upland stuff. And I've, I've been on a couple of different waterfowl hunts, but I haven't hunted around dogs enough to where there's like some things that I hadn't thought about with, and the guys were telling me in Michigan, um, and, and this actually happened a couple of years ago with them. They were telling, saying, put the safety facing down so that you can't, the dog can't accidentally step on your safety and, and basically make the gun hot because they had a dog step on it push the safety hot and then the trigger got pulled when the dog was stepping on it and that gun shot in the in the corn and i'm like dude i never would have thought about that because i'm not hunted around dogs a ton so uh you know i I just call that one out because that's a good tip for anybody that's around a dog because that dog in between birds these dogs are running around they're kind of all over the place they're excited to be there uh they're not always sitting as well as yours has this whole time you know so i think it's a good thing to call out well, yeah, and, and, and to that point also about safety, a uh, perfect example. Um, we had a client two years ago. We were uh, laying in the snow goose spread, so essentially laying in the decoys like you see on the videos, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, we always tell everybody, 
you know, load your guns when we tell you to load them and check your safeties after every time you pull the trigger. Well, it's it's literally dark. And I'm I'm uh, walking back from the side by side where I dropped them off and set up all the decoys. Long story short, I hear a gun go off. And immediately the first thing I did, it said, is everybody OK? And they said, yes. The guy had set his gun down beside him in a freaking uh, a stalk of a bean out of the bean field had got him between his trigger and his safety. You know what I mean? Safety yeah. was off, got in the trigger. And then this is the craziest one. When I was in Saskatchewan, I had a guy that leaned his gun up against his uh, back of his ground blind. And I was I know, 150 yards behind him working max. And he went to load his gun, didn't even pull the trigger, and it went off. What? Wow. Yeah, I'm dead serious. That's why I'm saying make sure your gun is pointing the right direction. There, I've seen crazy stuff happen that makes no sense to me. Yeah, man. Uh, always, always pointed it away from somebody. I just like I can't stress that enough. So, uh, all right, Matt, this was really great, man. Uh, I always do the thing at the end. So tell people where they can find you and uh, if they want to connect with you. So uh, I'm I'm on the Go Wild platform. Uh, new user, probably like some of you guys. I, I actually really enjoy it so far. So um, you know, I, you can find me on there. I, I do. I try to do my best at adding gear that I really think is essential in my gearbox and stuff like that. So if you guys find me on there and have any questions, I don't care if it's Hayes calls, whatever. I mean, reach out. I'd be more than happy to help somebody get in the sport. Love it. And let Matt know, uh, you know, tag both of us if you're logging the show. So you can go to the, when you're logging the show, uh, you go to plus to post and you can hit log time and you can go to outdoor podcast and you'll be able to search the show and find it. So tag us, let us know what you thought of the feedback. If you got any other tips you want to add, let us know what your tip would be. Um, you know, I always love, I, I really enjoy reading the podcast logs on go wild. Cause I get to see what other people thought about the show and they'll make guest re uh, requests for future shows and whatnot. So, uh, make sure for you guys still still hanging with us here, we'd like to get you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you're a podcast listener, make sure you subscribe to that show. We're dropping a new show every Wednesday around 7:30 ish. You know, depending depending on how things are rolling. So uh, appreciate everybody showing up. And remember, we did put all of the gear that Matt's mentioned, all of this awesome gear he's talked about, uh, which is a lot. My team's gonna have a lot of combing through to do. We're gonna put all that in the show notes. And so if you don't, you don't have to dig. You know, we really try to make this easy for you all and uh, try to help you. So Matt, thank you man thanks for coming on to the show and thanks to the audience for for sticking around with us thank you brad